Hello everyone, today I'm going to present the portrait of Elizabeth I. Before we start, I want to mention that this historical period is very interesting and there's so much history there to unpack. Both Elizabeth's life and her reign and the marriages of Henry VIII are also very fascinating. However, because of time's sake, I won't go into too much detail regarding that, but I encourage people to do research into it if they're interested. I also want to mention that there are so many portraits of Elizabeth and that I did not include all of them in this presentation, but I included a lot. The list is by no means exhaustive, but I tried to add some of the most famous and some lesser known portraits of her. Because there's so much to go over, I will not analyze all the paintings I included, but I would rather focus on one main theme, and that is the theme of virginity. I will only mention a few words for most of the paintings. This means that the presentation is a bit longer than others because there's a lot to go over. And that being said, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. So there have been countless movies and shows created on the subject of royal British history and many on-screen depictions of Elizabeth I. So sister to Mary I of England and daughter to the infamous King Henry VIII and his second wife Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth I, also known as the Virgin Queen, was the last Tudor monarch who ruled England for 44 years. Henry VIII is famously known for starting the Protestant Reformation in England following his desire to annul his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon in 1503 without papal approval because he desperately wanted a male heir, thus creating his own church separate from Catholicism in which divorce was allowed. So in 1533, Henry married Anne Boylan, a young lady from Catherine's entourage, and thus Elizabeth Tudor was born. Anne would end up having two miscarriages, thus failing to provide a male heir. So Henry had her arrested for several crimes of dubious nature, and she was beheaded in 1536. Henry would marry four more times, three of which would be equally disastrous. However, his last marriage, to uh, had the most positive impact on Elizabeth. So Catherine Parr, Henry's last and final wife, was the gentlewoman who arranged for the 10-year-old Elizabeth to have the most distinguished tutors in England, one of whom was renowned scholar Roger Ascham. Elizabeth would end up reading and speaking in at least seven languages, and she was also educated in classical subjects such as rhetoric, languages, philosophy, history, and theology. This brings us to the first portrait of Elizabeth, which is one of the earliest surviving images of her as a princess, painted about a year before her father's death when she was 12 years of age. The Royal Collection Trust describes how Elizabeth's gown is made of a crimson silk fabric woven with a pomegranate pattern and with lines of gold showcasing the precious metal threads. Additionally, the triangular forepart at the front of her skirt and under sleeves are made of a more expensive fabric known as cloth of silver tissued with gold, also with a pomegranate pattern. These types of fabric were specifically reserved by sumptuary law to the king and his closest relatives, thus conveying a strong reference to her royal birth, even though at the time she was still officially declared illegitimate. This painting showcases Elizabeth as a potential attractive bride based on the luxurious fabrics and expensive jewelry, and her holding a book, perhaps a Bible, symbolizing her piety, while the open book behind her is showing her extensive education. Here is another close-up of the fabric. And here is the close-up of the book behind her. I find it interesting that the pages are left blank, whereas in other earlier paintings, we often see pages stopped on a biblical passage. So do you have a theory why the pages are left blank? Because I cannot find much information on it. So Elizabeth became queen in 1558 at age 25, following the death of both her siblings, who were heirs to the throne. Author John N. King wrote in his article entitled Queen Elizabeth I, Representations of the Virgin Queen, how despite Elizabeth's vows to a life of perpetual virginity, she actually entered into a symbolic marriage with England as her husband. As such, in the following quote, King notes how her maidenly chastity is not to be interpreted as a sign of political or social deficiency. It is rather a paradoxical symbol of the power of a woman who survived to govern despite illegitimization, subordination of female to male in order of primogeniture, which is the state of being the firstborn child, patriarchy and masculine supremacy, and who remained unwed at a time when official sermons favored marriage and attacked the monastic vow of celibacy and the veneration of the Virgin Mary. As we can see, in a time of extreme oppression of women, 
Elizabeth defied all odds in a way that has never been seen before. Additionally, the celebration of her virginity was a synchronic phenomenon that would begin to be seen both in works of literature and art, in which she would be presented as a new Judith or Deborah, which were both important military figures from the Old Testament, as Eliza Triumphus, Triumphants, as we see in this image, or as Astrea, Diana Cynthia, or Venus Virgo, which were all virgin goddesses. The non-wedded Elizabeth taking the throne in 1558 made the English parliament anxious about the future of their home in regards to having a woman rule a country devastated by debt and a constant threat from France, Spain, and Catholicism. This adamance rooted in sexism and misogyny can be seen in the painting The Clopton Portrait right here, painting the same year she took the throne where she is shown having androgynous features. In this painting, she is seen holding a book to showcase her intelligence and piety, imagery reminiscent of her younger self, while at the same time her body is hidden under black clothing to block out any feminine shapes, intensified by her square shoulders and hair tucked away as an attempt to legitimize her as a ruler. Here are more close-ups. So early in her reign, a peer from the parliament wrote on behalf of his colleagues a letter to Elizabeth in an attempt to convince her to marry and produce offspring. In 1562, the queen caught smallpox and almost died, which only amplified the courtiers' anxiety, resulting in a draft proclamation being written the following year that would prohibit publication of the queen's image because they were deemed to be deformed, which were thought to be painted to undermine her authority. Here we have the Hempton portrait. Uh, and it illustrates a great example of a good and approved portrait, one that paints Elizabeth as entering the marriage market, filled with symbolism of fertility. Dr. Christina Faraday describes the painting as following. Elizabeth rests her hand on an X-framed chair under a cloth of gold canopy of state emblems of her authority. She is wearing the red and white colors of the Tudor dynasty and holding a carnation, a common symbol of courtship. Here's a close-up of her dress. And to the right of the painting, there is a verdant band of flowers, foliage, and fruits, frequently in pairs, which evokes fertility. For two decades, Elizabeth was struggling with marriage negotiations, all unsuccessful in the end, and once she passed her 40s, childbirth was deemed too risky for her. Here is a portrait that is not in my essay, called the Darnley Portrait, and this is how the National Portrait Gallery describes it. It shows Elizabeth looking cold, haughty, and imperious, wearing a rather masculine doublet with a lace ruff collar, double string of pearls looped around her neck and carrying an ostrich feather fan. Behind her on a table lies her crown. It was an image that was much reproduced and it is rather more lifelike than some of her later portraits, which created the idea of an ageless virgin, virgin queen. Technical analysis has shown that the colors in this painting have faded over time. Elizabeth's now extremely pale complexion would have been much rosier, However, the red pigments in the flesh paint have faded over time. The golden brown pattern on her dress would originally have been crimson and gold. And here is a close-up of her dress with the crown behind her. And of the feathers. To continue, increased references to Elizabeth as the Virgin Queen eventually started a new era of symbolism due to her never marrying. Women were expected to remain virgins until marriage, and because of that, around the 1580s, the sieve portraits were painted. This is another painting not mentioned in my essay, so here are some close-ups. Uh, this is the sieve portrait mentioned in the readings that I discussed in my essay. These portraits represented an iconographical shift, and it was mostly evident in a royal portraiture, that started to incorporate esoteric virginity symbol into arcane allegories that would have be been impenetrable to casual observers. As such, the symbol of the mundane utensil that was deceived held by Elizabeth in these portraits celebrated her standing as a latter-day Vestal Virgin. Also being an emblem of wisdom and discernment, the sieve associated Elizabeth with the Roman Vestal Virgin, marking a turn in Elizabethan portraiture by introducing motifs of chastity, creating a version that is powerful because it is related to her purity. In ancient Rome, Vesta was the goddess of hearth and home, 
and Vestal Virgins took vows of chastity. Tucha was the mythological priestess of Vesta who was accused of unchastiness, so she proved her virtue by performing a miracle in which she carried a sieve full of water from the river Tiber to Vesta's temple without spilling a drop. Additionally, in this portrait there is a pillar on the left behind Elizabeth, which is a symbol of imperialism, and is decorated with roundels that depict the story of Dido and Aeneas, in which Aeneas rejected Dido's advances and then went on to found the Roman Empire. In this sense, there is the previous theme of androgyny, in which Elizabeth is identified with the male figure Aeneas, who founded Rome, and not with the widowed queen of Carthage, Dido. Here is a close-up of her dress. You can see the globe behind Elizabeth, which is also a symbol of England's imperial ambitions. And here is the close-up of the sieve. Here is the close-up behind her. This is another painting that was not in my readings or essay, but that I put in to show as one of the few examples of Elizabeth outdoors with a naturalistic background. According to the Royal Collection Trust, this represents Elizabeth as Paris, who is also a male figure, in their retelling of the beauty contest, The Judgment of Paris. The original myth saw Venus as victor over her rivals Juno and Minerva. This is the Roman version of the myth, the myth based on the names of the goddesses. Here Elizabeth I keeps the prize, an orb instead of an apple, for herself, symbolizing her triumph over the illustrious goddesses. And here is a later rendition of the same myth and the same portrait. Finally, the Armada portrait, which there are actually three of, celebrates the defeat of the invade invading Spanish navy, clearly seen in the windows behind Elizabeth, with the arriving and sinking ships, but also continues the purity symbolism, as seen on her costume embedded with sea-grown emblems, which are the pearls, of virginity and symbols of the Roman goddess Diana, the chaste goddess of the moon and controller of tides. Here is a close-up of the crown and left window where we see the armada coming in or arriving. Here's a close-up of the right window which we see the armada being destroyed. Here's a close-up of her face and her dress with the pearls. And here is a close-up of the globe. The National Portrait Gallery wrote that Elizabeth's fingers are resting over the Americas, indicating Elizabeth's dominion over the seas and expansion into the New World. On the right, there is this figurehead, and figure figureheads are carved sculptures that are placed on the front of a ship. Sailors have been decorating the front of their boats for as long as they created the sailing craft, and since there's not a lot of information that I could find, these are my own thoughts. The wooden sculpture, sculpture looks like a typical mermaid figurehead found on bows. However, Elizabeth is indoor and these figureheads are usually found on ships and are much larger. So this seems like a miniature figure, adding yet another nautical imagery that alludes to this historical event. It is also possible that it represents the goddess Diana, however, I cannot find a single depiction of her as a mermaid. And here's the second armada painting that I could find that I personally prefer a lot more than the previous simply because it's a lot more summer and I prefer the ships in the sea rather than in the sand, as we can see on the left window behind her. And it just seems more realistic too. So around the year 1592, Elizabeth began to be painted naturalistically aging, as seen in the Ditchley portrait by Marcus Gerertz the Younger and also in Isaac Oliver's portrait, the latter being the most disastrous experiment in terms of naturalistic portraiture. Although it was not mentioned in my source what uh, portrait they were referring to, so I could not find an image for it. Here is how the National Portrait Gallery describes the Ditchley portrait. The painting was produced for Sir Henry Lee, who had been the Queen's champion for most of her reign. It probably commemorates an elaborate symbolic entertainment, which Lee organized for the Queen in September of 1592, and which may have been held in the grounds of Lee's house at Ditchley after his retirement, Lee lived at Ditchley with his mistress, Anne Vavasor. The entertainment marked the Queen's forgiveness of Lee for becoming a stranger lady's thrall, which I'm not really sure what that means. Here's a close-up. Um, the portrait shows Elizabeth standing on the globe of the world with her feet 
on Oxfordshire. The stormy sky, the clouds parting the, to reveal sunshine, and the inscriptions on the painting make it plain that the portrait's symbolic theme is forgiveness. The three fragmentary Latin inscriptions can be interpreted as she gives and does not expect on the left, and she can but does not take revenge on the right. And on the bottom right, in giving back, she increases something something. We cannot see it because the last half of the sentence is cut off, so we don't know what it, what it says. And finally, there's this sonnet on the right, which was perhaps composed by Lee, though fragmentary can mostly be reconstructed. Reconstructed, And the subject of the sonnet is the sun, which is the symbol of the monarch. Uh, the quote-unquote failed age portraits brought on the authorization of the anachronistic mask of youth that appears in paintings of Elizabeth in the last decade of her reign. This would ensure that Elizabeth would be depicted as being very young, as notably seen in the rainbow portrait that depicts the preternaturally youthful queen with the shoulder-length hair of a marriageable virgin. This was a deliberate tactic used to allay fears regarding the succession, resulting in the depiction of the queen looking like she did when she was a young princess, with the cut of her bodice also being lower to show her female forms. The portrait includes the Latin motto non sine sole iris, no rainbow without the sun, further emphasizing the esoteric sphere of impresa or admiration. Her right hand is delicately delicately grasping a bow-sized rainbow, symbolizing Elizabeth as a peace bringer. As such, Elizabeth is the sun, and without her, there is no peace. To continue, Dr. F.A. Yates explained that the years and eyes on her cloak signify fame because they are part of iconographer Cesare Ripa's prescription for winged fame in Virgil's Aeneid. Symbolizing thus Elizabeth's fame as flying rapidly through the world, spoken by many mouths, seen by and heard by many eyes and ears. Other authors claim that the eyes and ears represent Elizabeth's omnipresence in her realm and her impressive spy network. Additionally, Dr. Yates mentioned that the serpent and armillary sphere are attributes for intelligenza reflecting her wisdom in both heavenly and earthly matters, while the heart-shaped jewel refers to concilio, or council, because the best council comes from the heart. The armillary sphere was the symbol that both Elizabeth and Anne Boylan used. Furthermore, the floral decoration of the bodice and sleeves, recognized as being roses, pansies, honeysuckle, and cowslips, are wild flowers that sprang unplanted in the golden age of the Greeks, as read in Ovid's Metamorphoses and Hesiod, thus meaning that Elizabeth was restoring to England an eternal spring like that of the golden age. Then the crescent moon jewel on her crown represents the queen as chaste Diana, emphasized by the pearls she is wearing. The gauntlet ornament on her rough color is a ceremonial motif, while others believe it is a symbol of her military endeavors since she famously defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Finally, the coronation portrait was copied around this time from a lost original, and in this portrait the artist has found a nice balance between Elizabeth the earthly woman versus her as the divinely ordained ruler. Both the coronation portrait and the rainbow portrait show Elizabeth extremely young despite being in her 60s. This is an interesting contrast looking back at early depictions of Elizabeth where she had androgynous features as an attempt to alleviate concerns about a woman ruler with the last portraits at the end of her life showing her fully feminized almost to make up for the times they did not believe in her to be a legitimate ruler. In a following quote, author John Ann King explains well the iconographical transition during Elizabeth's reign. Political concerns of the kind stated by the queen shaped the representation of her virginity in the iconography of the first half of her reign. Maidenly chastity was a necessary attribute of her claim to be a legitimate and marriageable queen. The straightforward virginity symbolism of Elizabeth's early images differs from the esoteric iconography of the virgin goddess Cynthia or Venus Virgo that emerged in the 1580s and flowered during her final decade. The coronation portrait in which the queen wears the regalia of investiture typifies the early phase. Although the portrait was painted on a panel close to the time of her death, its depiction of the queen's youthful features is modeled on a lost original. 
Her facial appearance is in line with the anachronistic mask of youth, characteristic of her last years. Possibly this portrait was used as a funerary image. It is noteworthy that Elizabeth's long hair flows down onto her shoulders in the style of an intact virgin. As we can see, the symbolism of virginity was an essential part of Elizabeth's reign as a legitimate to and it legitimized her as a ruler, and her youthful look was preserved until her death as a way to immortalize her as such. The National Gallery portrait describes this painting as the following. It shows the queen crowned, wearing the cloth of gold that she wore at her coronation on the 15th of January 1559, previously worn by Mary I, her half-sister. She holds the orb and scepter symbols of her authority. And here are some more close-ups. To conclude, most Elizabethan portraiture have no definite artist names attached to them, making it difficult to restrict them into a single common style. However, their commonality lies in the symbolisms used in each painting, especially when it comes to the theme of virginity. Additionally, the portraits were done during the transitive period of the High Renaissance and into Baroque art. Elizabeth was 38 when, she, when Caravaggio, dubbed the father of Baroque painting, was born in 1571. Most of Elizabethan portraits have the dark backgrounds typical of Baroque painting, but they also lack the dynamism, theatricality, and movements of it. They are still reminiscent of Renaissance geometrical compositions, often emphasized by her triangular shapes formed by the dresses she wears when she is depicted full body. There are no movements in her portraits, meaning she is always static in her posture. There is no linear perspective in any of the portraits or realistic or naturalistic backgrounds, with the exception of a few. The dark backgrounds seem to be used as a way to only focus on Elizabeth, which is emphasized by her luxurious and extravagant garments she wears. Despite the lack of diagonals or linear perspective that would normal normally direct one's gaze towards a focus point, her garments seem to be the ones taking on that role, directing our gaze towards her face. Regardless, Queen Elizabeth I continues to captivate many people, whether it be by her life history or the intriguing portraits. Thank you for watching and these are my sources.